Now, he's going to be speaking this afternoon on a risk-based approach to improving ICS, cybersecurity, and resilience. Over to you, Joel. Thank you very much. we got the mic on. Got volume coming up great. So, first of all, I'd like to begin. Salam alaikum. It's an honor to be here for the third year. I'm kind of an original in the first group. Uh, I very much encourage this event to... Um, as, the, as the benchmark, because it is an incredible opportunity to see all you in the audience and to see a true concern for addressing a problem that faces us all globally. And it's a good forum for information sharing and exchange. <clears throat> and the concepts that we cover here are very valuable. So I know that now there's two bad spots to be in whenever you're on an agenda, the last spot before lunch or the first spot after. So I am not going to take the original allotted 50 minutes. I'm going to try to get us out of here at noon is on schedule. So I got to watch my time down there, which is a little offset. But the idea here is to talk a little bit about some key words. So if I can get my presentation up, 27, no problem. All of the slides are going to be presented. So again, we got to get the presentation up so I can start because there's some things in the beginning I want to point out. Um, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a couple big QR codes on a couple slides, the beginning and the end. One of them is my contact information. Another one is going to be, right now it is a placeholder, where I have, um, I'm planning to put over the next 48 hours a list of a lot of the background material used to develop some of this work that I'm going to show you, which is really going to talk about these key concepts of resilience as, ter as a form of improving your overall position of in addressing attacks not only today, but hopefully in the near future. We've got to get the presentation up. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. So on the lower right, I'm going to show these again. I don't know if anybody's got QR code readers on the phone. Very effective way to get you information quickly. That one with the little AE comment in it is my contact details. And then this one happens to be the URL to the web page. So again, we'll go through. It'll be at the very end. And as we break for lunch, I'll leave it up there. So the idea here is to start to talk about words. I was very happy to see today's conversations and some of the ones yesterday have a lot of focus on the word risk. One thing that we are seeing is that we are seeing the lack of the term resiliency. Resilience is a very important concept, and we're going to kind of talk a little bit about that, okay? Because my opinion is, is I'm not going to come up here and regurgitate a lot of statistics from a lot of people that have never stepped foot in an oil refinery in their life. I was born in the oil business. I've been working in it for close to 35 years. I know the problems that you're going through. And the issues that we're dealing with today are not about trying to solve IT problems that they're having difficulty implementing from 10 years in the past. We have operational problems and operational resiliency that we need to address. So let's get started. I do a lot of work both in public and private sectors. And of course, as soon as we go to public sectors, Probably our biggest client is going to be the U.S. Department of Defense. Now, I know the military is very different than the oil business, but the one thing they start to teach you is there's a lot of good references in their practices and procedures that teaches you how to create a scenario whereby you actually are focusing on essential functions and services. Because in the end, when we look at any sector, you should be able to take a cybersecurity process methodology and whether you're in the oil business or the transportation business or the consumer goods business, the concept should remain the same. You should be able to take a basic business function and tie it to specific threats. And through that mapping, find the weaknesses in your architecture, both in terms of your physical architecture and your logical architecture to determine how you can reduce risk and improve resiliency. What we see when we go into customers, because believe it or not, I'm the face and name behind what's called SCADA Hacker, SCADAhacker.com. And in many cases, I was actually hired to come in and review the work that was performed by service providers. Because I was a company of one, I could not take on large projects that required thousands and thousands of man hours. So I would kind of be um, an overseer of very large consulting companies, large automation companies. And the one consistent problem that we saw is that people tend to focus all, almost all, of their attention 
on weaknesses. And then take those weaknesses and go back and try to figure out the threat vectors and threat actors that could potentially take advantage of those weaknesses. Well, we have found, and it has been confirmed through a lot of hands-on work and actual implementations, that we can not only reduce the cost of implementing a security program, but we can improve its overall strength and resiliency. Because we focus on the end, the end result. So right now, this week, I'm currently engaged in a very large transportation project. And the most important thing about transportation is it's not oil. But the one thing that's true is that they have essential services and essential functions. Transportation is pretty clear. Moving people from point A to point B. You can start to assimilate easily the indirect consequences and services. People have to get from their home to work. So there is enormous value in understanding what from a cyber and a physical perspective could impede those particular business services. So let's talk about this. The way that we approach this is through a very, very comprehensive methodology that's called the TVRA. Now the one reason that this is different is that most of the documentation, including a lot of documentation developed by the American Petroleum Institute, API, talks about security and vulnerability assessments. The problem with those processes as they're published is they fail to account for risk. And they fail to account for the proper identification of threats. If you don't have threats identified, how could you ever deploy security controls? And probably one of the best examples is the single greatest threat facing companies is insiders. Yet when you look at the security controls that they choose to implement, almost 100% of them are focused on external threats. So if you know that the threats are inside, not necessarily malicious, but accidental, why are you not addressing those problems? And the reason is, is that they're trying to separate risk from the threat and vulnerability scenario. Okay, so let's walk a couple of these through. This is something you all are probably very familiar with. I am a very long-time KPC um, individual. I worked on some of the original projects here, one of them being Equate. I was involved in the refinery upgrade at El Shuaiba. So this business I know very well. And one thing, um, I did a blog post yesterday with Mr. Dale Peterson, or a podcast, I mean, and we talked a lot about the difference between how me as a security consultant approaches you and how other people. So I look at a real world problem. This is the refinery that I started out. I was 21 years old. This is where I worked. It's a large US asset by Middle East standards. It's not. About 275,000 barrels a day of processing power. One integrated petrochemical complex. We had multiple plants. Within each plant, there were numerous process areas. Within the process area, tens of thousands of sensors and actuators, hundreds of controllers and subsystems, dozens of networks, and on and on and on and on and on. So what's the attacker going to do? Oh, I'm sorry. What are you going to do to defend against that attacker? So there's a little guy up here. This is a Waldo. So when I do this in a funny sense, it's the where's Waldo scenario. There is an attack scenario on this refinery. And I tell you what, I do not agree with somebody that says, tomorrow you have to have 100% of those 100,000 assets secured. That is a fallacy. It's fictitious and it'll never happen. So a good process should allow you to identify today exactly where you start in that plant. And I'll tell you on this particular plant I have met with my former employer, I no longer work for them, but... I know the three loops that I could attack in that refinery that brings it down. And guess what? Those same three loops would bring down Al Shuaiba. So the, 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 the thing I really liked was when I started to see Sinclair and others talk about the importance of the domain or process or industry capability. That's what really makes an attacker powerful. And if we look at not the general Verizon data breach report statistics, but rather the industrial incidents to date, those cases showed 
that the attackers had specific domain knowledge. They knew the centrifuges that were used at Natanz. And that's why that attack was successful. So, the issue here is that when you look across the globe, there are, at best cases, tens of millions of devices that are insecure by design. Okay? I hate that term. Hate it. I've been in the automation business my whole life. That means that in order to upgrade, replace, or migrate those tens of millions of devices, you're looking at hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars. It's not going to happen. So anybody that comes in here and says, you've got to move away from those devices, well, I might consider finding a different consultant. Because the reality is we have to deal with what we have today. We spent billions building these assets. And it's not like we're going to come in and because somebody says that you have a bad controller because it uses some vulnerable protocol that the world's going to end tomorrow. A good program should be able to handle this type of resiliency. So what I did was I started to look at why it, we're having problems with resiliency. And what I found is that there really isn't a globally accepted definition. So I took two heavily referenced definitions, right? The, one, the first comes from a very well-published document, and it talks about the idea that resiliency is the key because it talks about how you can tolerate and ride through and in turn recover from what you have not anticipated, right? So if you know the weather's going to be bad, you can fortify, you can build dams and levees to try to protect yourself from the rising sea. But what if the problem came from another direction? Resiliency helps address that. Now, the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technologies has gone pretty public in some of their documentation and says that this element is truly the key. This is the key to how we are actually going to have truly effective long-term strategies rather than what I'm going to call as ad hoc or spot solutions that we see today. I call them the standard of the day. Or in the United States, it's the regulations of the day. The NERC SIP standard has gone through five significant revisions since it was introduced just over 10 years ago. That is unacceptable. Nobody can keep up with that. And the reason is, is that it lacks the incorporation of resiliency and how the controls are implemented and selected. The idea here is that Security and resiliency should be considered as very distinct domains. However, they do have complementary interactions. So security doesn't need resiliency. Resiliency doesn't need security. But if we're going to try to solve this problem, we need to address them both. So the way AECOM took about this was we created an entire methodology around this concept of resiliency. I brought some flyers if you're interested after the, after the session. This concept is called Converge Resiliency. It's actually a very successful approach that the U.S. Department of Homeland Security just issued a contract to us to create a cyber-physical framework for the owners and operators of critical infrastructure in the United States. This is a key element. And again, today, it's nice to be at the end of an event where I can start to blend what people are saying. The concept of the cyber and physical, or I prefer to call physical and logical domains, along with the electromagnetic spectrum, is very important. A core component of our TVRAs is what's called a TSCM, or a Technical Surveillance Countermeasures Assessment. We do a true broad spectrum analysis. Because I'll tell you right now, people that are targeting you are not going to use a Wi-Fi access point. They are going to use far more sophisticated means in the same way that they want to encrypt their malicious traffic on networks, they are going to do the same using obfuscation techniques in the electromagnetic spectrum. So the idea here is to take this portfolio across all domains. And I know people are going to boo me off the stage when I say this. When I engage with companies, I do not go to the CSO. I go to who owns corporate security. And most people know that starts at the board of directors. Because there's one word in a CISO, 
that I don't accept, and that's the I. Operational security is not about data. It is about maintaining operational functions, which means the operations department does not report to the CISO. The engineering department does not report to the CISO, yet those are vital components in how we maintain effective business integrity of any asset, whether it's a refinery or a food processing plant or a water for purification plant. So that's where we're trying to move. And when we start projects that way, they are highly successful. Because it's not whether you work for this IT or OT group. It's whether you're performing information security roles or operational security roles. I had one client when I first started out that the same people that provided cybersecurity leadership were responsible for physical protection of the board of directors and chief executive of the company because they believe that security is security. And I think that those in this room would agree. Today, cyber is not used in an island on its own. It is a blended component of a cyber physical initiative, which typically, and I'm gonna say with the exception of finance, where the total motive and the total consequence is really something very logical, which is money, Today, it's not really a physical paper or coin thing as much as it is a, a transaction. But if we look at most other industry sectors, the cyber attack is used to accomplish a physical means. Whether it's an invasion of military forces in a country, whether it's to take tools like cars, trucks, planes, and cause them to crash and kill people, the idea here is that they all tie to the physical world. So I'll move this on. The way that we address this resiliency is to take a look at existing frameworks. I am really an advocate of frameworks. So this thing on the left is the NIST cybersecurity framework. Okay, now NIST is very US centric, may not apply so well over here. But the methodology that I created prior to joining AECOM allowed me to take this framework and overlay it on top of any standard you want. So, of course, the NIST document, as it's written, really looks at three or four key um, standards. The 27,000 series, 62443, and NIST 853, when we look at the broad security controls catalogs. But the idea here is you should also be able to take this and apply it to any document or any best practice that you see fit for your industry. And then combine these two with the magic secret, right? So the framework addresses cybersecurity. It is a list of security controls. What it fails to do is talk about this resiliency aspect. That's where processes and methodologies that have been implemented and proven show to work. And rather than make this a full-blown workshop, I'm just going to start one page. But the idea here is that every category of control should be be mapped to every type of asset. That means that if you have malware prevention techniques that you put on a Windows-based computer, how are you preventing the introduction of malware on people? How are you preventing the introduction of malware on an embedded device? A Honeywell C300 controller or a Siemens S7 400 PLC. Most people will say, I don't know how to do that. But the problem is, is that's why we don't have resiliency. Is if you take a standard and says you have to protect, protect your Windows computers today, and in six months, somebody creates malware, which it already has been, that targets PLCs, what are you going to do? And that's why right now, most systems, when we actually mock them up, we take the security controls. Now, these are very heavily funded projects where we actually take an organization's implemented security program and put it on an offline modeled system, it's very easy to penetrate and compromise. So the resiliency comes from this approach. So what I did, I'm watching my time, they did reset it, thank you very much for that. Here's a scenario. By most standards, this is a well thought out and reasonably secure. I'm gonna put this at security level two, two to three, on the 62443 scale. 
We've got an office computer. The office computer is the only computer that's connected, that can connect to the internet, which means that computer has to go through all IT security controls. It has to go through whatever IT is doing to filter and manage contact coming in, manage DNS resolution going out. There are no removable media allowed from this point in. So there's no removable media, no USB flash drives. All of the industrial network is secured. There is one firewall, very common. That firewall allows a single connection from this particular office computer into the industrial network where it places files on a server. Everybody in the industrial control network then accesses this server for their updates, and they use it as a common um, identification and authentication management system. So they're using Active Directory with group policy objects. And at the very end, we have done something very important. We have completely physically segmented controllers, the, the PLCs or the C300s or the S7400s, from the high-level architectures. So the way that looks architecturally is something like this, right? So again, there is no DMZ here. I do, I do this for simplicity, right? Because you want to keep this minimal. So the production network kind of adds as a buffer zone. So this is a three-zone model. So some people will draw a three-zone model and include a DMZ. This is a three-zone model that lacks a DMZ. So what we're going to do in this particular attack scenario is let's use Black Energy 3. This was so successful. I developed this as a live demonstration. For about two years, I was flown all over the world. I brought all this equipment and showed this to show how the two most common controls, antivirus and firewalls, are completely ineffective against somebody today that knows how to attack. So the idea here is we're going to take a client-side weakness. It can be anything. In this case, you see an Adobe diagram. When I demonstrate it, I do use Adobe. But the idea is that Black Energy 3 did just this. This attack sequence was exactly the TTPs used in the Ukraine attack in 2015. So again, let's imagine that the office computer was compromised with that magical macro-infected Excel spreadsheet. Now the problem is, and this is where the whole mindset of IT versus somebody that is really more aggressive on their approach to security says, you have to realize from this point forward, once the computer's been compromised, the attack from this point forward will appear as though it originated from that individual. So this is technically an external attack. But logically, all indicators from this point forward will appear as an insider. Okay? So what I'm going to do is, remember I said there's one little indicator, there's one opening in that firewall. So now that I know that firewall is opened, I'm going to use it. In order to connect to the firewall, I'm going to use standard Microsoft SMB connections on 445. I also need 135 to take care of my authentication. Hey, I follow the standard. I have separate authentication domains. The industrial network has one set of Active Directory forest and domains. The office network has a completely separate one. So I have a completely separate authentication domain. Now here's the problem. Once you're in, you're appearing as this legitimate user. Now we start to pivot. So the first thing we do is, nobody ever thought we could get into this computer. This computer was isolated. There's no vectors for malware to come in. Right? So, IT has taken care that everything that comes into that office computer has been scanned properly. So, there shouldn't be malware vectors. So, in this particular case, people say that because that's unpatched, you really violated a policy. No, I actually didn't. Because there were no vectors, right? If you don't have a vector, how is the malware ever going to get there? So, in this particular case, we have the domain controller, you compromise it. Once you've compromised the domain controller, you might as well go home. Because once you have access to credentials, you no longer need vulnerabilities. So this is why anybody that focuses on vulnerabilities, they say, have a nice day. You're going to miss the attack. Because from this point forward, I have credentials. Windows has embedded capability to allow me to perform functions remotely with valid credentials. The PS exec command infrastructure is installed. 
IT wanted it on there so that we could do remote management of those computers to make their job easy. So we've got it in there and everybody knows it's there. Now here comes the big problem. No vulnerabilities on that computer. Completely patched, minimal install. But once you're in that computer, you have access to a network that everybody says you don't have access to. I.e. the exact scenario used in the Ukraine. So as soon as the Ukraine attack went public, this video went back online because everything was textbook. So when we talk about all these problems with ICS, no, this is problems with a basic understanding of risk. Okay, now I know my time's running up. So the idea here is that what we commonly see is that at the top, these machines are relatively easy to secure. They're very well defined, well known. We have baseline security configurations because we're following best practices. We implement the latest and greatest software, patches, antivirus engines, application whitelisting, whatever you want it to be. The problem is, is that they have minimal impact to operational integrity and risk. There is very little that office computer could do. If you actually did a threat map of how it could impact operations, because operations is all the way here at the bottom. Here lies the problem. The controller on the bottom is very difficult to protect, but extremely high in risk score in terms of its impact to operations and business function. So where do you think we should start this project? At the bottom, right? Where do you think most people start their projects? They start at the top. So what happens is, is that you work through this architecture and by the time you get to where the real risk lies, you've expended most of your budget and you actually, when you put risk back into the evaluation, get very poor risk reduction. So you've really done a bad thing. So the project that the team at AECOM is working on together with me, one of the key aspects of the TVRA is the cost benefit. Where for every control that you select, you actually have to show the risk reduction benefit. So that somebody can't say, well, it's, it, come on, it's 2017. You have got to put patch management in your solution set. No. And I'll tell you what, I went into this architecture, it's never been patched a day in its life. But I tell you what, it was one of the most secure architectures I've ever seen. And of course, we don't get into details about it, but this team of professionals knew what they were thinking about when they actually looked at security because they believed in the same concepts, right? Malware has to find a way into a network. It can't fly in, which is why we do electromagnetic spectrum analysis. But you can see kind of where we're going. So what you'll see in the presentation and since my time's up, and I'm actually doing pretty good, this is where I wanted to get to, is that I will walk you through that attack, and I will show you the risk identification piece, which is where you'll talk about the vector, you'll discuss the undesirable event. You remember my little curvy guy that goes through. And then the consequence of that single step. So when we talk about the office computer, what did the office computer compromise allow us to do? It allowed us the installation of remote access Trojan, which gave us remote command and control. It didn't compromise the PLC. It didn't compromise the HMI. It didn't steal credentials from the Active Directory server. Right? So you can't try to, you got to focus on really the consequences of that attack. Because the idea, and Dale did a good job yesterday talking about this. I got one build before that, but I'll focus right here. The idea is that when you start to look at consequences, you're going to see something very different. You're going to start to be able to take them and now apply them to a net business function. Right? So the idea here is that this process is very successful for our team because we can take it into any industry sector we want. There are no PLCs in transportation, but there are devices that perform an identical function to a safety controller or an SIS in transportation. So rather than get hung up on the architecture, you can take the process in 
and do this mapping. The way resilience comes in here is by the build that I walked right over. My view as skatahacker.com to resiliency and defense in depth is not what you commonly see in all the big famous published white papers, which is that what we call an onion diagram, where you start at physical security and you work your way all down to the center where you get into application security and kernel control. My idea of defense in depth is A, you cover all aspects of an attack sequence from deterrence to correction and response, and you should always have at least two. Because right now, a lot of people depended on malware detection devices, but new malware may not necessarily be detected because the authors of malware are becoming very crafty and very creative. So signature-based detection mechanisms is very ineffective now because we just change our, 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 our signatures. And you work your way down through here. And when I talk to people in oil and gas, it's awesome because we all know what fault tolerance is. Most of our architectures in the control world are truly redundant top to bottom. The sensors are dueled in the field, but we always have multiple or redundant fault tolerant inputs, control processors, communication processors, networks, servers. Right? So that's a very uncommon architecture for a lot of information security people, which is why a lot of the standard information technology products don't work well in those architectures. So now we have this kind of fault tolerance. So this was a good slide to break because, again, what I, would, what I have done is kind of walk this scenario through where I talk about the two controls at each step to try to get you to think about things differently. And since I, I'm about one minute, 30 seconds over, I promise to be as close to, to the noon break as possible, I do want to talk about this the conclusion slide, is that standards are mandatory. We need standards. They perform a vital starting point into how we address a very complex problem. But frameworks are what we need to provide consistency. As soon as you develop a framework, it's something that can be repeated across the KPC family. And for me, it can be taken across the oil and gas downstream sector or the transportation sector or so on. But what's most important is the prioritization that must occur. One thing, and kind of like what I said with that refinery drawing, and I have made some tweets about this during one of the prior presentations, you can't have two most critical anythings. One thing has to be number one. Another thing has to be number two. And that's why oftentimes I look at these security programs, and that's why like NIST 853, eh, I kind of giggle at it. 80% of the controls in that document are priority one. Wait a minute, that doesn't make a lot of sense. That makes it very difficult to implement. So we need a process where you can prioritize what you need to do tomorrow, and once you finish that, what you need to do the day after that. So that's where we get into the prioritization. Because there in the TVRA versus a standard security and vulnerability assessment, you do the mapping to business functions. And then, of course, effectiveness. Effectiveness is always going to be tied to risk. So you can't measure the effectiveness of a security program unless you can apply it against a risk management framework. And again, that's kind of where we get into some of these events. And most people, when I ask what RMF do you use, people give me a, a blind stare. Is that they're trying to address these programs. Now again, people that say we're using 27,001 and 2 normally will say they're using 27,005 for their RMF and the supporting 27,000 series documents. But when I start to look at people that are using other series of documents, sometimes they fail on that. So again, I thank you. I'll be around all day. Um, there's the QR codes, I promised. Again, sorry, I didn't want to run too much into lunch. Thank you. I did bring a brochure on.